Um, uh, thanks, Neil. Thanks, uh, PMA LA and Shabzil and Fandango folks. I think it's wonderful to have everybody out here. I, I went into my closet to pull out the T-shirt from the first product camp in 2008, the one that says, this one time at P camp, right? Um, uh, we had fewer people that year. We had maybe 175 folks turn out for the first P camp in San Francisco. Uh, actually, it was at Yahoo down in Sunnyvale. So it's great to see more than that here. I'm thrilled that you've got uh, a local community and a network, and you're helping each other, and you're teaching each other. And this is all about communities. So I hope everybody's going to have a great day, make some friends, find some jobs, whatever it is. Great. Uh, so I had a bunch of prepared talks already done, and Neil and I talked, and he suggested I come up with something new. So if I stumble, it's because I haven't actually been through this before. But uh, topic for the day, product management, good, better, and best. So we'll think about uh, you know, how, to, how to get into this and do the, the minimum thing you need to do to be a product manager, and then what it looks like when you become a good and truly great product manager. So let's see if this is going to work. Uh, OK, so uh, we said this already. Uh, there's a picture of the book. If you don't have one, let me know. And a uh, useful thing for me is I've been working in software since steam-powered computers, if anybody remembers when that was. Remembers the year the Macintosh was launched. I was writing code then. Uh, I've been doing product management for a long time. And it's been a pretty lonely, small tribe. So I'm really, really excited that the tribe's bigger and that we're getting together and, and we meet up. And it's hugely important that we all pay it forward and help each other and learn. So thanks for being here. Um, good. Uh, the, the realization, I, I guess for me, maybe late in arriving, is that when we talk to folks who aren't product managers about how they know they have a good product manager, they're almost always talking about little bits of deliverables. They got me that user story on time. And whatever documents I needed to assign a product number got to me in time. And it seems to be mostly about the little bits and the details and running the process. And that the folks who are consuming a lot of what we do honestly are more interested in promptness than in quality. Because it's pretty hard to tell the difference between a mediocre requirement and a great requirement until you ship the thing and nobody wants to buy it. So um, you know, we're in a situation where a lot of the time our consuming stakeholders aren't sure what good looks like. And we know that great product management is a lot more than just deliverables. By the way, we all need pictures here, right? Down in LA, everything's about pictures. So I think I have the deliverables picture here, which is, this is the new Amazon drone. Uh, it's actually, I think, in, in uh, the San Fernando Valley. You could see it was a Christmas shot, right? So deliverables, deliverables, deliverables. But just putting stuff into the pipe isn't really greatness. It's really just the minimum thing. So you know, we earn our pay. We become great because we make hard decisions, because we think about markets, because we bring people together, because we drive something more than just some piece of paper or entry in our rally system that looks like a user story. So, so that's the theme for this morning. Um, and I have to admit I'm not a sports fan, but every one of these talks seems to require a sports analogy. And I hear there was some stuff going on in Russia a couple of weeks ago, so we'll go there. Um, and I'd like to lay this out in three pieces, which is there's some minimum amount of basic ability you have to have if you wanted to become one of those great ice dancers. You start with a lot of years of doing those figure eights, the, um, what are they called? Um, requisites, requirements, whatever. Sorry? Compulsories. Compulsories. Thank you. Right. I knew there was a word for it. And you spend a lot of years doing that, right? Because you can't get great until you first learn how to do the basics. And, and I'll suggest there's something we'll call the minimum viable product manager, who is the person in this case who can do some figure eights, right? Um, and from there, and you work hard, and your parents take you to a lot of those uh, practices that you didn't want to go to. And at some point, you become a technical master. Right? Here's a picture of the Canadian skating team. Um, not many of those won gold medals. On the other hand, those were all people who could do that two minute and 50 second short program and not fall down and impress a whole lot of people. And they are you know, 99 and 7 eighths percent better than everybody else in the world who could skate. And, and I take my hat off to them. Right? But there's another step. So that's, that's good. That's really good. But uh, there's brilliance. 
right? And sometimes we can recognize brilliance, and sometimes it's hidden. Uh, I grabbed the obvious picture here. Anybody who knows who these are? Right? Meryl, what's her name? Davis, Davis and Charlie, Charlie White, right? Um, watching them, I, I thought they had um, repealed the law of gravity. Honestly, I have no idea how they did any of the things they did. It wasn't just that I could watch them do figure eights. It wasn't that they failed to fall down in their two minutes and 50 seconds. It's they did something truly incredible that I don't even understand. And I think when we think about what we do, we want to strive to move ourselves from the minimum viable set of activities to every once in a while doing something that's pretty darn impressive. And maybe even on a great day, our co-workers and stakeholders can recognize that it's great. Not always required, but sometimes it happens. So um, I think what we'll do is, um, right, so here's our minimally viable product manager, right? There's, I get to write the book on this. Eric Reese had that other thing. I forget what his book was called, right? But um, learn the tools, right? Keep the process flowing. You're not the person who's gumming up the works and at least product is flowing, right? And technical mastery means you've been able to apply all the best practices. You can take the tools that are out there and maybe choose the right tool. You know, it's not just templates, it's putting the right things in the templates. And then I think the strategist, the, the truly great product manager, is the person who pulls out really interesting, unique solutions to problems, who looks at the world in a slightly different way and turns the cube, who sees around the corner to what's going to happen next. Right? And those people are rare, but uh, I have the privilege of knowing some of them. I hope I'll meet a couple of you here. Um, those are the folks that we all seek out because we know that having that right person in that product management chair uh, probably turns the company around. So let's disassemble that a little bit. I was going to pull through four different little examples of things that product managers do and try to build those up from minimally viable to technical mastery to strategist. Uh, before I do that, um, and for those of you who've seen this little dance before, I apologize. I'm going to throw a chart up that I use all the time uh, to try to explain what I think product management is. Because to a person, I bet none of us knew before we took that first job, and maybe none of us got some help figuring it out. Um, so I spend a lot of my time trying to evangelize the idea that there's real skills and expertise here, and everyone needs a diagram in order to see it. So let's look at that diagram. Right Here's the four things we're going to talk about. Oh. Did I lose some slides here? I guess I did. All right. Um, let's go back and do what's on the agenda. Um, so four, four pieces of, of uh, product management, four areas, and let's take them in order. And let's think first about market insight, which is how do you know, how do you find out what's happening out in the world, and how do you build products that folks want? In my case, I'm a revenue guy. right? So I work with and for companies that want to make money on technology. And so it's not good enough that people want it. It's really even better that people want it and will pay for it, because that's a nice step, right? And I think the minimum viable market insight here is this one, right? Um, somebody else told me this was a good idea and put me in charge, and it's my job to deliver this thing, right? Um, we all know that when the neighbors come by and spend their 10 or 25 cents for lemonade, honestly, they didn't really want lemonade, did they? <laughs> They know your dad, whatever it is, they're trying to you know, raise that next generation of entrepreneurs. But somebody told me this was a good idea. right? And having worked on a lot of products that seemed like a good idea at the time, but I hadn't done my homework, and it turned out, well, that was a good life learning experience. That was character building. right? That was a chance to experience some really new things other than revenue. Um, Minimum viable is, yeah, I'm the product manager for this, and somebody told me it was a good idea. Right? So how do we lever up from that? Um, if we think about some markets that are pretty well understood, right? so I think most of us understand the car market. Certainly in, in the LA area, we all understand the car market. right? Um, there's lots of surveying. There's lots of companies. The features are pretty well established. The segmentation is pretty good. And if you market or sell cars, you get it, right? But you've got real technical mastery if you can figure out how to get one more interesting car into this market. Um, and it's all pretty stable, of course, until we see a Tesla or a Prius, which really defined a lot of things, or maybe your Nissan Leaf, right? It's a stable market until it's not, right? Um, but you know, if we look at great, 
um, you know, you're really going to want to deeply understand the problem that your customers are trying to solve. Not the problem they say they're trying to solve. Not the problem your boss says they say they're trying to solve. Not the good idea that your engineer had because everybody's just like him and of course everybody in the world can write a valid SQL statement so we don't need user interfaces, right? Um, you got to get into the heads of the people who are your customers. So, of course, Here's, I think here's my picture, right? So, you know, you got to be a little bit telepathic and you got to think past what people say and you got to dig deep into their needs. There's a, a great product I use. It's a silly little $20 product called PDF Signer. And what it does is it lets me open up a PDF document and stamp my name on it and save it. And I can't tell you how many hours every week that saves me on non-disclosure agreements. Because honestly, I only run you know, Photoshop once a year and I never remember how it works. And all I want to do is put my damn name on the piece of paper. And here's a product that was made for me. And for $20, it saves me a couple of hours a week of trying to open up a bunch of things I'm incapable of doing. Right? So somebody there really saw into my head and said, gosh, you know, for 20 bucks, we have a market for that. Right? Makes sense? So again, if we're thinking about market need and market insight, it's more than doing a few surveys and it's more than listening to what a few customers say. It's getting out, it's rubbing elbows, it's listening to the problems, it's trying to get inside the heads of folks who are frustrated. Right? And the great product managers are people who are channeling that sentiment, who can finish the sentences of the folks who might want to buy their product. Right? Let's keep going. All right. Uh, Agile, well, there was a lot of discussion here about Agile and Scrum. So um, change our analogy here. So minimally viable Agile product ownership, and I'm using that carefully. Anybody who's read my rants on this know that I believe that product ownership's critical and deeply important and a very, very small subset of what product management does. Right? But honestly, if you haven't done it before, it's a good time. Right? Pick a model. I don't care if you're doing Scrum or Kanban or XP or TDD or choose your acronym, right? Do something. Uh, figure out what your part to play is, right? So these are junior high school musicians, right? We, we know what this sounds like when they play, right? It's vaguely defined as music, okay? It's certainly sound and on a good day you get some good things out of it and all the parents are happy. Right? Um, but you start there, right? None of us become great agilists in one day. And it's important that you pick up your instrument and figure out what your part is and you play, right? And you get better at it. And it honestly, I think it doesn't matter where you start and it doesn't matter where you start from. You need to throw yourself in and do it, right? Clearly, technical mastery looks a little different. Um, so here's actually, so this is a real string quartet, and they're called the Jasper String Quartet. I'm sure nobody's heard of them. But they're doing something very special tonight in New York, which is they're playing in Carnegie Hall. Anybody know how you get to Carnegie Hall? Practice, practice right? <laughs> practice, practice, practice. And when we look at really strong, agile teams, what we see is that everybody knows their part, right? That beautiful music or software or whatever it is comes out. There's great pacing. Right? It's a pleasure to be on it. Right? The backlog's groomed and the stories are the right sized and planning meetings don't take too long. Right? This is what technical mastery looks like. And again, I don't care which religious flavor of Agile you're doing because mine's better than yours. Right? Um, but this is what a great team looks like. But so far we haven't found the, you know, the next step up. So of course it is. Anybody know? Come on, we're in music. What are we doing next? What we're doing is jazz, OK? Because the great, great product managers with the great, great development teams give up all their very special roles. And they give up the narrow definitions of which parameters they're doing and who owns the story and when stuff has to happen and who has to have the good ideas. right? Because I don't know if you guys know this, but all of your developers are smarter than you. How do I know this? That's right. I asked them, and to a person, all of your engineers will have told me that they're smarter than you, right? <laughs> it, so it must be true. Um, but the point here is, if you're doing a great job with your development team and you're sharing 
not just the user stories, but why the customers care and what problem you're solving, you get to do something really special, which is you get to mine the great ideas in their heads, and you get to solve problems as a group, and you get to trade off leadership, and you get to have somebody else play the solo for a while. Right? You're still the product manager, you're still the product owner, but you don't have to be right. You just have to get to the right answer. And so what I see as greatness here for product managers and product owners is that we've stepped out of our role a little bit and what we're focusing on is getting a great team of really smart folks to build great stuff. I had the privilege of working with a company in Palo Alto for about six months. I parachuted in as their interim product guy because they had misplaced their product manager. Long story. Um, uh, 11 people on the engineering team. company was called Wealthfront. Great, great company. Um, I'm tremendously impressed with them for a lot of reasons. And their 11-person engineering team uh, was so good and so efficient and so smart that I couldn't keep up with them. And that my job often was to carry the good idea from them back to whoever else needed to review it because they had a lot of really great ideas. And I got to be much more of the team player than the parental figure who told everybody what the answer was because honestly, they were three times as smart as I was. Four if you ask them. Okay, anyway, but the point here is, again, if we pick up the Agile model, at the very beginning it's, can you do the thing the book says you're supposed to do because Ken Schwaber says that's what Scrum is, right? And the, and the technical mastery is to have a team that really holds together and produces great stuff. But greatness, greatness is when you break all the bonds a little bit, you know, and you do what has to get done because it's a very cohesive team. All right, let's, um, let's go ahead. Something that's very near and dear to my heart is pricing, right? And everybody leaves pricing to the end because it's complicated and it's hard and we're really focused on shipping bits, software, hardware, whatever it is, right? Everybody's focused on did we get to the launch date and can we put this in a customer's hand? Everybody forgets the little thing at the end like should we charge for it and how much, right? So minimally viable pricing for me looks like this. We, we had a price on our thing, right? We got to launch date and we actually know what we're gonna charge and uh, we probably copied it from somebody else in the market, and we're not the reason that we failed to ship, right? We had a price, and so that doesn't s stop shipping. And it looks either like this. I'm making it app, so it must be $2.99, right? Okay, works for me. Or I'm doing some business-to-business -business product, and so it's a subscription, and it's 20 bucks a month per user, right? Those are really good, safe answers. You can copy them from here. I won't care, right? It, it fails a lot of the tests, but it meets the minimum viable pricing standard of we're not going to hold the shipment because you didn't put a number on the page, right? Okay, so let's pick the game up a little bit and say how do really good technically mastered product managers think about the problem? And here's a chart. By the way, anybody here who's working on an online service, software as a service? Okay, do you have a chart that looks like this? Yes, you do, right? You all have a chart that looks like this. There's no magic, there's no secret. Um, there's some set of basic features that you get when you buy the basic version of the product, and that might be bronze, silver, and gold if we're in our Olympic metaphor here, or small, medium, and large, right? And there's some support, and there's some capacity. Everybody gets the monthly newsletter, right? When you sell up, you get some something that people want, something that's cool, and whatever, right? And then you take the advanced version and you get a whole bunch of new stuff, right? Every online service looks like this, or it should. And so if you're a technically mastered product manager, you know it has to look like this. And the interesting part is, did you figure out which features are the ones that are gonna cause people to upgrade and put the extra money on the table and why, right? If it's a freemium model, Let's make sure the, the basic thing works, but what's the thing, the feature, the ex, extra special upgrade thing that's gonna cause somebody to go from basic to expanded and pay us more money, right? Because you really need to understand the mechanics of what's happening in your customer's mind in order to know that you have the right things. And if you do it wrong, right, well, you don't want to do it wrong. <laughs> okay, so we know that that's the standard chart for such things. Everybody can find it, but the technically proficient expert product manager puts the right things in the right columns and rows and makes a lot of money for the company and makes customers happy, right? We know this, 
All right, so, but we're not inventing new science here, right? This is well-known, well-understood science. So let's take the next one, which is there are some companies, and there were product managers there, who did something dramatic and changed an entire market, and in my view, in these cases, by rearranging the unit of pricing, okay? What the Netflix folks did long, long, long before streaming, right, was they took the old Blockbuster model. What was the Blockbuster model? Yeah, it was late fees. It was pay per movie, but you had to drive there, and they made most of their money on the fact that you didn't get back in time, and you were angry at them, and you weren't sure it got in the slot, right? Blockbuster made its money on, you know, making its customers unhappy. And Netflix changed the unit of work from movies per night with egregious overfees to flat fee per per month. I could watch as many movies per month as I wanted, and if I didn't return that red envelope, it was on me. And if I did, I got to watch more movies. And the incentives and the excitement meant that by changing the pricing and changing the business model, suddenly, uh, is block, does Blockbuster still exist? You guys down here would know, right? Yeah, all right. Netflix, I know, still exists. Um, Zipcar, right? They changed the unit of work from drive to an airport and rent a car by the day and pay lots of weird fees to get it by the hour and it's nearby and if I only need it for an hour, I bring it back, right? Uh, Salesforce, obviously, I was at a company called iPass that did some work in dial-up, uh, open table. I'm going to take as our example, though, Charles Schwab because we think of investing online as a pretty sleepy market, right? Anybody have a Schwab account? Okay, good. Um, and they did something in the 90s which was cool, which was they brought investing online, right? And in the 90s, Schwab made its money on a transaction basis. If I bought or sold stock, I paid them the $9, and they made money. And if I didn't buy or sell stock, they didn't make money, right? But in the 2000s, they did something really special. Here's a screenshot. I apologize. Uh, there's something at the very bottom here, if you can see it. So this is their mutual fund search screen. Right, so I can find mutual funds, and I think I have here large cap U.S. value-based mutual funds for anybody who has a retirement account, right? And at the very bottom it says, one source funds, no load, no transaction fee, okay? And with those words, Schwab actually put itself in a new business and completely crushed its opponents and changed the definition of the online investing business because suddenly I could buy some of those mutual funds and not pay a fee. Okay, well, how is Schwab making money on this? The answer is some of the mutual funds agreed that they would let Schwab put this up at no fee and the mutual funds would pay Schwab. And not only that, they would pay on an asset basis. So if I bought $50,000 worth of some mutual fund, that fund would pay Schwab a small fraction of a percent of that $50,000, whether I ever traded or not. And so suddenly Schwab is in the asset management business, and all the mutual funds are trying to decide if they're going to kick in to make those funds free to me and get me as a customer, or they're going to hold back and have Schwab charge fees and have nobody buy that fund because nobody wants to pay those fees, right? And Schwab turned itself from a transaction game into an asset management game where the mutual funds pay all the freight instead of the end customers like me, right? A small change in pricing a huge change in the business. And probably nobody in this room saw it happen, but Schwab is a whole lot bigger and more important than it was 10 years ago because they've turned this market on its head with a small bit of pricing jujitsu, right? And so the opportunity, I think, for us is to look at our market and say, how can we use pricing, among other things, as a strategic lever to change the game, to rearrange what's happening, to put our competitors at disadvantage instead of just copying their price and putting it on our price sheet, right? And so the truly brilliant, you know, bring it all home product management folks see through all of these standard models and they think about the markets and they think about the economics and they create whole new opportunities where there weren't before and often you don't even see it. So I think these guys are terrific. Uh, let's keep going. All right. Um, Let's talk about organizational skills, right? Um, I spend a fair amount of time mentoring and coaching first-time product managers. They're almost all ex-engineers, or they're still engineers. And to a person, they all believe in a world where everyone is rational, 
Everyone makes rational decisions based on facts. They all remember all the facts. And the way to win an argument is to marshal more facts and to keep, keep arguing until the person at the table with you understands that you're smarter. Okay? And going back to Neil's chart, there are some personality types for which that works. Doesn't work for salespeople. <laughs> Doesn't work for executives, right? Um, it's hard to put yourself in the place where you realize it's important to lean over the desk somebody, notice they have a picture of kids and ask them about their kids, or to have lunch with them, or to think about their motivations, or to understand how different organizations are going to react. So for me, the minimal viable product manager has some really basic organizational skills, right? Plays well with others, and sales is willing to invite you to the meeting because you haven't misbehaved so badly before that you haven't screwed up your chance. So here's our little picture, right? Plays well with others. Um, if you can't play well with others, you can't even get to minimally viable, okay? But let's take the next step up, which is technical mastery. And uh, if anybody did the business school thing, the MBA thing, so I learned one thing in business school, which was um, people do what you reward them to do, not what you ask them to do. Right? That was what every class turned out to be the answer for. You need to understand how the departments in your organization work and why they do the things they do and why do we hire sales salespeople that act that way? And then why do we end up paying them twice as much as I make? Right? Um, you got to understand how people work and how the motivations are and how you're going to rally support because honestly, you're the CEO of not so much. Right? You're the sheepdog trying to move the sheep ahead. You're the cajoler. You're the person who has no authority here. Right? So how do you help everyone do the right thing in the absence of a real stick? Here's the carrot. Right? And so you understand the difference between org charts and whatever. Right? If you don't think organizationally in how to motivate people in your company, I think you've missed the technical mastery step. And there's some study to do and start with um, um, you know, how to make friends and influence people, right? Um, Dale Carnegie, right? It's really dumb. You should read it. Okay, but <laughs> it, it's so obvious that most of us miss it that there's a relationship here when I need something from you. And it might even be useful that I helped you last time. <laughs> Good. So technical mastery, we all need to do this. Let's go one step up, right? Anybody remember who this is? Come on, you're all too, too young, right? It's Robert Duvall as Tom Hagen in The Godfather. And what was the role that he had in this movie? Conciliary. And what is the conciliary? He's the confidant. He's the counselor. He's the person who's not in the seat of power, but he's the one that everybody goes to to ask the question, right? Um, so the truly great product managers have internalized how people work and think and how to get into their heads and how to get the right result. And so they're, you know, they're thinking about the personalities. They play in their heads the game of, if I pitch it this way to so-and-so, how do I think she's going to react, right? Um, they're the people that everybody in the organization comes to off hours to ask those kinds of questions. Gee, I could use some help. And gee, I, you know, I'm a little confused, right? You know how that, who that person is in your company, right? Maybe it's you, right? And, for me, the, the sort of premier example is every company's executive team is broken in a unique way. Anybody who's read Tolstoy will recognize that right? all unhappy families are unhappy in a unique way. right? Um, and, and I'm from Silicon Valley, and I was very, very briefly a CEO, and I wasn't any good at it. So I can say that most of the CEOs in my valley had really bad childhoods and are still trying to live out of it right? <laughs> through their companies. right? Um, if you understand the, the personal dynamics of your executive team, you can make a lot of things happen. And if you just sort of sit back and let it all wash over you, then you're just an object, right? So again, technically proficient but brilliant product management is to see through the org chart and to understand the people, right? I think I have one more here. Let's keep going. Oh, maybe I don't. Okay, so uh, a great product manager in my view a truly superior product manager is able to do a few things, right? Um, really, really understand what customers need, not just what they say, not just what your boss says they say, not just what Gartner says they say, but get out there, rub elbows, listen for an hour at a time, ask open-ended questions, find out what's in their head, right? Um, you can quantify the value, particularly on the business-to-business -business side. 
my customers will pay me $45,000 for this because, and that sentence has to end in some math, right? Not hand waving, not empty value statements, right? Um, we build products through our partners, our engineering partners, our marketing partners, our support partners, our sales um, overseers, um, whatever, right? Th we don't have these folks working for us. They're our partners, and the only way we get products built is through those folks, right? Um, we gently manage the organization because honestly, the organization's not interested in us managing them. And if they figure it out, sometimes they're upset. But we manage the organization the same way we manage our product, right? And we have to help our customers understand what the goodness is. Yes, we have marketing people, but it's really handy because you understand what customers need. If you help the marketing folks get it right, and it's even handier if you can put together enough material that the sales folks get it half right or three quarters right because it's action at a distance, it's leverage, right? So how do we think about what customers want and keep the rest of the organization honest, right? Does that make sense? Um, so, so there's my sort of qualification list for great product management. Here's my contact stuff. Short answer is it's really easy to buy your last name as a domain if you do it in 1995. Um, <laughs> back to the Future may be the only way some of you guys are going to be able to do that, but here it is. So um, drop me a line on LinkedIn or email or whatever. Let's go back to this as a summary. Um, I'm thrilled to be able to do product management because I think it's some of the most fun things you can do at the office with your clothes on. Um, and I'm really ex <laughs> I'll deny saying that, but I think we're being recorded. Um, I, I'm really excited that you're all here to, to share and to help each other and to be part of the tribe because it's been a long walk in the desert for some of us for several decades. And um, I'm just excited to be in LA for the day. So thank you.